Welcome to the takeout. Visually, it's kind of a movable feast. Last week, we were in the sumptuous Park Avenue apartment set. We were on the second floor of the Washington, D.C. Bureau. As you well know, by the time you hear this or see this on CBS News 24-7, the Democratic National Convention will be over. We are recording this on August 21st, so some of the big tent poll events haven't happened yet. We have a fascinating guest this week who is not yet a household name, but we're going to work on that. We're going to work on that. Part of that is to have Timothy Shank join me here at the CBS News second floor desk. Timothy is a professor of politics and history Bingo. at George Washington University. More importantly, he is the author of a book that's coming out in October called Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics. He also had a piece in last Sunday, again, August 21st, so dated back to last Sunday, New York Times. Harris has a rare chance to re-engineer her party. Timothy, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks so much for having me. What do you mean by re-engineer her party? Well, I mean that she's coming in at a time where she has two advantages that nominees, especially someone who's not a president, normally don't have. Number one, she has a party that is freshly in love with her. They're ecstatic. They're excited. She didn't have to go Rapturous, through this almost. grueling primary where really we can see now one of the major consequences of the primaries is that you're always annoying at least part of your party base. So she skipped ahead on that. She also has a party that's terrified, right? They People, Democrats, they love Harris and they are still terrified of Trump. And they also know that victory is within reach. It seems like it, but it's not guaranteed. So I think that means everyone is in a kind of maximally pragmatic stance. You know, they want to do close to whatever it takes in order to keep Donald Trump from going back into the White House, which means that there's an opportunity for Harris to lead the party that it's hard for me to think of. And I'm a historian, like I live this stuff, um, that's how I make my bread, but it is hard for me to think of another Democratic nominee who has the degree to sort of reset not just the public impression of herself, which is still malleable for lots of people, but also reset the image of the Democratic Party. You write in the New York Times about this reengineering project doing something to repair the frayed connection the Democratic Party has with working class Americans. How long has that connection been frayed and what is the source of that fraying? It's been going on for a long time. And it's for the historian, me will say that sort of the core of the Democratic Party of relationship with the working class broadly, that's forged in the 1930s under FDR, the combination of the Great Depression and the New Deal. But almost as soon as that relationship sort of begins to really develop in the 1930s, it starts to come apart. So already by the 1940s, World War II comes along, that's pushing away some of those class-based issues that were at the center of the New Deal. In the 1950s, there's a further distancing. Turns out that a lot of working class people, including people in unions, really liked Ike, and that they weren't all that impressed with like Egghead, Adelaide Stevenson. But the real crack comes in the 1960s. And by 1968, when you see the Democratic Party at war with itself over Vietnam, George Wallace, who begins his career as a Democrat, but in 68 is running on a third party ticket that's not just segregation forever, but a broader campaign against this bipartisan elite that he says is out of touch with the old core of the New Deal. By that point, there's a crisis that's underway that's obvious. And it doesn't mean that the Democratic Party is transformed overnight, but it sets in motion this long rolling process that forces Democrats to ask really painful questions about what it means to be a party for workers when a lot of workers don't seem to want to support you. And then the next stage of this process, so if you have a beginning in the 30s where it already starts to cracking, after the 60s, another transition, Trump going down that golden escalator in 2015, that just sends the entire process into hyperdrive. So something where even Barack Obama, when he's running twice, does much better with especially white working class voters than we would expect for Democrats today. Hillary Clinton and even Scranton Joe Biden don't do nearly as well as Obama. And that brings us to the present where Democrats are faced not just with this prospect of losing white working class voters, but increasing difficulties with black and brown, blue collar voters as well. And it is an assumption of the Harris campaign, fresh and emerging as it is, that it can get by. Mm -hmm. It can eke by with this estrangement with working class white Americans, non-college educated. Can it? Well, that was, it's unclear to me what exactly is going on in the Harris campaign mindset, but one concerning sign for me was an early memo from Jen O'Malley Dillon, who's campaign chairperson, where she was saying that exactly what you were saying, that the way for Harris to win is by essentially doubling down on the Democratic strategy, 
since Hillary Clinton. No, didn't work for Hillary in 2016, but did well enough for Biden in 2020. And she says, if there's any place we can expand, it's going to be with white college educated voters. She saw real room to grow there. The problem, as we all know, is that this is a coalition that can put together a majority on the national level, but struggles in a lot of those key battleground states. So I think that there is just hard headed electoral reasons to be concerned about that. But as anyone who thinks that Democrats should be the party of workers and ordinary Americans, I think it's a question not just about can Democrats win elections, but what does the party really stand for? And I think that there is an opportunity that she faces now where if you want to go big and not just squeak out another election, but push for a real a majority that's large enough to really get things done, the kinds of things that Biden wanted to do, but because he was hamstrung by only having 50 votes in the Senate, never really got in a position to do, there's the long run benefits of a commitment to bringing working class voters into the Democratic Party in a real way. It's good politics. I also think it's good policy. So evaluate simply from the vantage point of politics. Yeah. Kamala Harris's economic speech in North Carolina. She says, I'm going to empower the federal government to keep an eye on price gouging and empower the Federal Trade Commission to investigate and perhaps penalize if corporations are amassing too much wealth and taking too much out of the consumer's pockets. She wants to create more housing units, more apartment units, and use the tax structure to incentivize that. She wants to expand Medicare to negotiate drug prices to bring them down, more on the tax credit, more on earned income tax credit. Does that fit into something that is oriented toward working class voters? Absolutely. It's a great start, but it's only a start. And I think one reason, one area where she can sharpen the campaign even more than she is at present is not just by laying out this positive vision of what she wants to do, but by being really clear who's standing in the way of this. And this is maybe as it's the old Bernie crowd and me coming out, but I think there's something to be said for, and as AOC was doing, I think really brilliantly in her speech on Monday, pointing out that this isn't just happening, or we're not just getting these nice things because Donald Trump and his buddies are standing in the way, but that tapping into this, not just a partisan discontent with Republicans, but a broader working class discontent with a system that's rigged against ordinary people. And I think that the danger for someone like Harris is that she comes across as a representative of the party of everything is basically fine if we get good people like us in charge. And that tapping into more of this anti-institutional sense which comes with a deep-seated feeling that the game is rigged against ordinary people, which I happen to believe, again, this is a case where policy and politics are aligning, but I think that if you want to really tap into that popular spirit, you need more of that explicit uh, confrontation with the people who are standing in the way and broadening the case beyond Trump himself. Quick question, does it help Kamala Harris to get nagging, finger-wagging from editorial boards like the Washington Post talking about these economic ideas as gimmicky and too populist? This is, I think, the consequence of Democrats being the party of institutions in a time of anti-institutionalism is that they have to deal with this double standard where Donald Trump can say that he wants to repeal the tax on tips. Fox News isn't going to call him out for the details of that not working. Democrats have to deal with that. Luckily, that's not something that I think any swing voter is going to care about. It's a case that Harris has to manage for her coalition. Luckily, it seems like Democratic Party-based voters, they don't care that much about that stuff either. But what I do think she has to worry about is not just sharpening that populist message, making sure it comes across clearly and consistently, but also making sure that the right policy can exist in isolation, but it needs to be driven home again and again and again. It needs to be supported by a comprehensive program. She needs to make it clear that this isn't just something she's saying on one day. This is something that's going to be driven into the head of voters because they know that if they elect Kamala, this is one of the things that she's going to be working for on day one, 30, or the handful that matters. 30 seconds. Can you be a joyful populist, I meaning have this idea, this bounce, which they talk about, this energy, but have this harsh or gritty populist message? I think AOC, again, really pointed a way toward this in a, in a speech that I thought I had some problems with, but what I loved was when she described herself as a patriot who loves his country so much she's going to fight for all of its people. And I think that the best populists have always been those happy warriors. Even FDR tapped into that energy. 30 seconds. We're going to talk very good. Timothy Shank is our special guest. More of our conversation about if and how and whether Kamala Harris as the Democratic nominee will re-engineer the party. I'm Major Garrett, segment two of The Takeout in one second. As left-wing parties become more consistently left-wing, right-wing parties become more consistently right-wing, you have this homeless population.
Welcome back to The Takeout. Timothy Shank is our special guest, uh, a professor of politics and history at George Washington University, author of the forthcoming book, Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics. And we're going to do a little history here because it's really fun and it's really relevant. Chicago has a long history of national political conventions, both parties. But Timothy writes recently in the New York Times about Chicago and the Convention for Democrats being particularly important in a historical context, going all the way back to 1896. So we're going to delve into that for just a second, and you will not regret it. William Jennings Bryan gives a very famous speech at a very tender age. <laughs> Talk about that speech and why it matters even to this day. And one of the things that's resonant, ladies and gentlemen, inflation. Mm -hmm. So this is William James Bryan, 36 at the time. It pains me to point that out because that means he's younger than I am right now. But he is an unknown Nebraska politician who Member of Congress, yep, yeah. rises before the Democrat convention to say that in its blistering denunciation of the gold standard. Details complicated. What matters is that this is actually a time when lots of, especially if you're a farmer who's taking out loans, you think inflation is your friend because you're having a really hard time paying back your debts. And the gold standard is the thing that's keeping the currency restrained. And William James Bryan says, mankind, we're not going to let this country be crucified on a cross of gold. We're going to create this inflationary boost in the economy that's going to lift the burden of debt off your backs. And not just that, but disempower this class of Wall Street oligarchs who's taken over the economy and taking over democracy. And through this populist movement that we're part of here, we're going to take our country back. And that is, it is worth arguing, is the origin for the National Democratic Party of this spirit, this ideology, this approach to wed popular politics and populism. Exactly. And what matters for this moment is that there is a populist strain in the Democratic Party that goes back to Andrew Jackson. But what's different is that Brian and his generation are the first cohort that's confronting industrial capitalism. So they were not just of farms and small businesses, but of companies that are still around with us today, like AT&T, like JP Morgan. And to the extent that we're still living in the world that industrial capitalism makes, we're still living in the world that Brian was trying to summon a political crusade against. And if you're watching or listening to this program, you love politics you're intrigued by these things, go back and read that speech. It is a remarkable effort in political rhetoric and persuasion and building an argument. And one of the things that I find fascinating about that speech, and I wonder if you do as well, Timothy, quite separate from this very famous line that has cascaded through the decades memorably, is he also tries to recontextualize what is a businessman. Mm -hmm. Because he says a businessman is not just someone who runs a business. A businessman is a farmer. A businessman is a shop owner. A businessman is a miner who works in a deep hole, pulling the resources out for the rest of the country to enjoy. Almost everyone is a businessman in one way or another, bringing that idea of if you're involved in business, you're a businessman. Exactly. It's the 1890s version almost of this campaign against the 1% or even a populist version of Mitt Romney had that line about makers and takers, mm -hmm. except that for Brian, the makers were everyone who's involved in producing things for the real economy. And the takers were, and this is a great unfairness for him, he feels like the takers are the ones who put in the little and get the most reward because they're the people at the very, very top. Mm -hmm. And as Timothy said, the underlying economics are complicated, gold, silver, if you can mint both into coinage. What does that do to the economy for those who wanted to keep and only have the gold standard? It was an Eastern orientation for the rest of the country, and it broke down very geographically that way. Silver was vital to their economic interests. Or at least it comes to stand for something that's Some plausible enough. Symbolic right? that it's, yeah, right. Silver stands for prosperity. Right. Or at least it did for the South and the West. The problem is that the Northeast and the Midwest, they weren't as into this idea of the party of the people. And it's a shocking case of how much things change over time. But Republicans actually win, I think it's maybe nine of the 10 most populous cities in that 1896 election. So even though Brian's summoning the people, most of them end up voting for the other guy. William Jennings Bryan electrifies the convention, becomes the nominee, and loses. Which brings me to something you wrote in the New York Times. Republicans, quote, live to kill Democratic vibes. 
and have a tested strategy for doing it. The William Jennings Bryant vibe was killed. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, uh, I'm sure, a sort of historical compendium of Republicans killing Democratic vibes. Is that something Democrats should be worried about now? Of course they are, because they, this is a election that Kamala Harris absolutely can win, but she also absolutely can lose it. And there's a lot of factors that are outside of her control, but there's also a lot of stuff that she can decide. And if she comes up with a compelling strategy that's ground that speaks to both the interests and the values of the voters who will decide this election, that's the best thing she can do. But it is very, very easy to lose it. You write with uh, some gusto about a portion of the American electorate that I want you to drill down for my audience for. You describe them as skeptical anti-elites who do not have a party. They lean left economically, but they lean right culturally. And then they have this phrase, you're going to dig this, folks. Burn it down moderates. Did you hear that? Burn it down moderates. Walk me through that. So the idea is that they're really dissatisfied with the way the system is running, but their diagnosis of the problem doesn't fit neatly with either a conventional right wing or a conventional left wing diagnosis. Right? They're not Ted Cruz. They're not Bernie Sanders. But they do think that the game is rigged and that the from the top on from the top on down that the system just doesn't work for people like them right and they are casting about mm -hmm. for someone or something and they've been doing it for a long time and this is where even though my politics are different i have a lot of sympathy because going back to the 1960s when that new deal coalition cracks apart and a lot of these burn it down moderates are attracted to figures like george wallace which again is why it's important to remember that in 68 he's not just running as like white supremacist he says no 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 that's alabama stuff i'm the national democrat i'm against the pointy heads the professors who can't even park their bicycle straight which even as a professor i have to admit pretty good line and <laughs> From that point onward, the names change over time. There are Wallace voters in 68. There are the Reagan Democrats in the 1980s. There are Ross Perot voters in, in the 90s that everyone is fighting over. And there are, Biden, there are Obama Trump voters in 2016. And it's not just the United States. Anywhere you go in the wealthy world over the last 60 years, you've seen variations of as left-wing parties become more consistently left-wing, right-wing parties become more consistently right-wing, you have this homeless population. And the thing is, because they're swing voters, how they decide often ends up determining elections. And what's really frustrating is that time and again, they keep voting for candidates, especially if it's a Democrat or another center-left party around the world, where these candidates will run as kind of cultural moderates and economic populists. But they get into office, and it turns out the economic populism stuff is hard, and there's a lot of reasons not to do it. And the cultural moderation stuff, well, there are victories you can claim on the cultural front, and that your base will be really happy with that, too. So that often, these voters who decide the election get the exact opposite of what they wanted, and it just keeps happening again and again and again. And they pull the lever, and they feel like there's should be something, someone responding on the other side, and it just makes them feel that the system is even more broken. But you don't make a happier dinner table out of cultural moderation. Mm-hmm, that may, well, maybe you do. I come from a family, I have a... But meaning that it's harder to get the kind of things that you want to make ends meet. Yeah, oh, okay, so the That's economic point. side, yeah. The yeah. economic side isn't addressed, and so, yeah, you, you may be satisfied culturally, but you are still feeling that you are struggling economically exactly. but or the, less satisfied than you'd like to be. And this is where, you know, I was a big burning guy in 2016, 2020, still am in my heart of hearts. But one, I've been thinking a lot about why the Bernie program didn't go as far as I would have wanted it to. And one reason is I don't think you can just like stamp the economic populism button as hard as you can and expect working class voters to rally around you. You need to make concessions to defend not just the economic interests, but also the cultural values. And thinking, I think what a lot of Americans, I think these people maybe more than any others, would like is if you could have afford to put good food on the table and then not have everyone kill each other over politics at that table too. And this is an insight that Barack Obama had too, just turning down the volume in the culture wars that allows you to hear the economic message more clearly too. Timothy Shank is our guest and I hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as I am. When we come back we're going to talk about Bill Clinton because he occupies a very interesting place in this conversation and his electoral success may or may not offer some suggestions for Kamala Harris. Timothy Shank is our special guest. Segment three of The Takeout coming your way in just one second. In both Clinton's 92 and 96 campaigns, in some diff importantly different ways, the theme is an all-out war against polarization.
Welcome back to The Takeout, coming to you from the second floor of the Washington, D.C. CBS News Bureau. Again, recording this August 21st, the Democratic National Convention is over, but as we speak, the big tent pole events have yet to happen. But this is still one aces of a conversation. Bill Clinton, why is he relevant to this particular issue that confronts Kamala Harris, and what lessons, if any, should she take from his approach in 92 and 96? So the problem that Harris is confronting today politically, if you accept with me that these burn it down moderates who feel sort of left out on either side, that those are the voters that she needs, not just to win a solid majority in this election, but to push through the type of transformative agenda that really could make the type of country that I sincerely believe. Meaning win House races, win Senate yep, seats, exactly. and have something that approximates a governing majority yeah. in Those Washington. Those voters, they're swing voters now. They're also the voters who've been trending toward Trump in the last eight years and who are sort of the most weakly attached to the Republican coalition. So if you want not just a victory, but a realignment, these are the voters you need to get. And those are the voters who have been up for grabs since the 1960s when the cultural polarization, the beginnings of the war between red and blue America, when that framework really locks into place. So if that's a problem she's facing today and it goes back to the 1960s, the 90s are interesting because that's a moment when the baby boomer generation, exemplified by Clinton, people who came of age in the last days of the New Deal order and saw the emergence of this new thing, you know, if you're telling the story of the Democratic Party, the post-60s story from the 60s to the 90s, in my reading, it's a lot of wandering in the wilderness. It's confusion. It's trying to adapt. It's sometimes fighting, sometimes going with, but not really knowing what to do with the system. What happens in the 90s is a generation that saw the New Deal order breakdown, saw this new uh, system emerge, comes up with a coherent plan for how to deal with polarization. And in both Clinton's 92 and 96 campaigns, in some diff importantly different ways, the theme is an all-out war against polarization to make Democrats a winning party again, first and foremost in 92, and importantly in 96, by restoring that connection with the working class. And importantly, Bill Clinton is freed in ways other Democrats were not of the trauma of the Cold War mm -hmm. and the ways in which it imposed on Democrats a sense that you had to be national security Democrats because if you weren't, you were soft-headed, weak for America, and there was this great peril out there. Well, Clinton comes along and we're recontextualizing all the things that we can invest in and spend toward and think about. He's freed. Absolutely. And he's building a bridge to the 21st century. He's not looking His backwards. words precisely. Yep. And so because he has this opportunity, this is a generational transition and there's a lot of frustration, especially in 1992 with an economy that hadn't been delivering, especially for working people for quite a while at that point. So that combination, the Cold War is over, allows the focus to come back to those bread and butter economic issues. And Clinton is there to take advantage of the opportunity. And yet, the orthodoxy, the bipartisan sense of things was in this post-Cold War era, the best thing that America could do would be to trade freely and to trade with adversaries that do not have yet fully or even partially democratically evolved systems because that commerce and that rules-based system will move them toward de democratic norms, create more prosperity globally. That was a near, not entirely, but a near bipartisan consensus. And the trade deals of that era reflected that. Bill Clinton was fully on board with that. And that is in one way, one of the reasons Trump catapulted to prominence in 2016, because that free trade and that orientation hollowed out communities that went solidly for Trump and are still looking for answers to this day. Exactly. It supercharges deindustrialization, which in combination with a lax approach to financial regulation, which helps inflate bubbles on Wall Street, and a failure to do anything serious about the long-term decline of organized labor, all of it helps lay the foundation for a backlash when the economy turns south, which of course happened to do in 2008 in time to help Barack Obama win election, but then handicaps him by saddling him with the baggage of this agonizingly slow recovery that Democrats end up sort of minimizing throughout the Obama administration because they don't want to admit that America isn't already great. Right. And if you look at, there's one part of America geographically that fascinates me. The easternmost counties of Iowa, right along the Mississippi mm -hmm. River. You go to those counties, you look at the numbers in 2008 and 2012, 20 plus for Obama, maybe 10 plus in 2012. They're now 20 plus Trump in 2020. 40 point swerves from first Obama to first Trump or second Trump. 
those places to me illustrate this as vividly as any part of America. Yeah, and there are some Democrats who will say that those counties are lost for good. And to me, that's insane. If you're willing to vote for Barack Hussein Obama in 2008, you can be willing to vote for Kamala Harris in 2024 and Democrats down the road. And it kind of, I think Democrats want to give up, they almost want to give up on having, on the idea that they can win over those counties because it frees them from the burden of having to try to change. And this was, in a sense, if you want to tell the story of the Democratic hopes for a Democratic majority, the big change is, in the Clinton years, the idea is that we can build a new majority if we can bring those pro-voters into the coalition. By 2004, there's this hope of an emerging Democratic majority, which means that because the country is becoming more educated, more diverse, we have this next crop of young Demographics people Demographics are destiny. Exactly. We don't have to do the work of persuasion anymore. And what infuriates me in retrospect, looking at the way this is described, is that these voters are often described as conservative whites, that Barack Obama, Democrats don't have to win over conservative whites anymore. And I think that's a drastic oversimplification of what these people believed. And it's a way of saying, we don't have to look out for either your values or, importantly for Democrats, or for your interests anymore. And the story of the party over the last decade, I think, is realizing just how drastically overstated that optimism was. Two things I also want to ask you about from your New York Times piece. Public, opi public opinion is a fact, and elections aren't a battle for hearts and minds. They're a fight to give voters what they already want. Explain yeah. those two concepts. So it's not something that, the funny thing is I think that people who care a lot about politics often have a hard time really reckoning with democracy, right? Because <laughs> if we care about politics and it's because we really believe in something, we wanna see major changes and we think that our view of the world, and I'm saying we because I definitely fall into this trap myself more often than I like to admit, that we can get rid of the other side, we can drive them out of existence, or we can just persuade people that we're right because it's so obviously true to us. And it's so hard for us to put ourselves in the head of people who have just more complicated and different views of the world and who, even if they're not immersed in the, like, the latest turn of the news cycle the way that we are, still really believe the things that they believe, take them seriously, and won't be talked out of them, at least probably over the course of an election. Persuasion, it's a long-term game, game, it's crucial, but if you're just thinking about how to win an election, then recognizing that democracy means translating public opinion into public legislation and that that public opinion isn't going to change overnight doesn't mean it's static. Of course, these ch things change over the long haul, but being really clear about how the limits that you have to maneuver in the short term, I think that's a starting point for any serious political strategy. And in that vein, Kamala Harris has two tasks, introduction, and specificity or more than two tasks? Oh, there's endless tasks. Right? In the piece I focused on sort of what I felt were lessons to learn from the Clinton experience, but there's making herself seem sort of a plausible commander in chief, coming across as someone who's relatable, that can you have a beer with them test. But I think that in a weird way, again, what politics obsessives like me, what we tend to understate is the importance of those policy questions. And that for voters, even if they don't pay a lot of attention to the ins and outs of, ins and outs of politics, that also means they're not sort of fanboys and fangirls the way that you, it's easy to slip into if you're on the right or the left. And that there is a sense among them, they just wanna see how is this gonna make a difference in my life? And making a plausible case on those pocketbook issues while reassuring them that she's in touch with the country on cultural matters. Um, among the many, many things that are on the to-do list, I think those two items have to be on the top of the agenda. There are those who sneer at sentiments like it matters to voters whether or not they would or would not like to share a meal or have a beer with a candidate. Do you sneer at that? It's fine. It's, I understand it. I think it stands, comes to represent what in a way to me makes a lot of sense is where are your values? In a world where you can make all the promises in the world and then come into confrontation with a harsh reality where everything's gonna be harder than you imagine. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And as I understand it, experience of president, lots of punching in the face. And to the extent that personality can stand as a kind of shorthand for when push comes to shove, what are your values? And when the world changes as we know it's going to do, how are you going to adapt? That makes a lot of sense to me. But again, I'm heartened by the fact that I think if you look at those voters who do end up deciding elections, the policy stuff also matters a lot more than people tend to think. Timothy Schenk is our guest. Again, his book, let me turn over my note page here, Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics. That's coming out in October. Ladies and gentlemen, he also had a great piece in the New York Times recently. Harris has a rare chance to re-engineer her party. I'm Major Garrett, segment four of The Takeout, when we come back. If abortion, if this was enough of a mover to get the election decided, then I don't think we would need Kamala Harris as a nominee in the first place.
Welcome back to The Takeout. Timothy Shank is our special guest. Like I said, not a household name yet. All right, this is focused a lot on economics, history, different voter subgroups. Timothy, this is going to be the first national election since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. I consider that, my personal opinion, take it for what it's worth, maybe nothing, maybe something, the greatest variable in this campaign the single greatest variable, because we do not know. We have small measures in statewide referenda held to date about the potency of this, this issue, the galvanizing force in it. And I will just tell you a quick story. I started covering national politics in 1990. Up until the Dobbs decision overturning Roe, in thousands and thousands of voter interviews I've done, I've met at least 250, probably more, but at least 250 self-identified pro-life single issue voters. I never met a single self-identified pro-choice single issue voter until the Dobbs decision. And I wonder how you evaluate with all this other information that we've been consuming that variable in this election. I think it, I agree with you that it ha, it's in the space where could be, it won't be nothing. It's definitely gonna be something. The question is, is it everything or is it the most important thing? And of course, there's no way that we're gonna know until election day, but. Is it the two and a half percent that turns a one percentage point victory into a three and a half or four percentage point victory, which matters a great deal in the electoral college map and other dimensions? Yeah, and this is where there's a version of the type of argument I make where it seems as if Nixon's silent majority is always around every corner and that what it means for Democrats to be in touch with mainstream values is just to pretend as if we're stuck in Eisenhower's America in the 1950s. And to me, that's clearly not the case. Whether it's the public rallying around abortion rights that we've seen since the repeal of Dob Dobbs, or rather the fall of Roe v. Wade, or the failure of anti-trans legislation to move voters in the way that a lot of conservatives had thought it would. You can see that even these burn it down moderates, it's a sort of centrist to conservative-ish, but nothing like a kind of hard right reactionary politics. And I think that it's clear that the cultural issues that are gonna be at the core of the Democratic appeal, abortion, has to, abortion rights have to be first and foremost. But I do think, maybe this is biased from personal experience, We've seen, this, we've seen this strategy work, but in the immediately different context of Virginia 2021, happened to live there, I saw Democrats run a very similar version of the democracy and abortion rights strategy, and it go absolutely nowhere. And the concern I would just have is that when abortion is on the ballot, it gets people to vote. When it's a state issue and people feel like it's really up for grabs, then it can decide votes. But when it is one of a mix of issues, people might be frustrated over inflation, they might be frustrated over the border, there's a lot of other things competing with it. This is where I would be wary about assuming it's a silver bullet. Definitely the most, maybe the most valuable weapon in the arsenal, but by itself not gonna decide the election. And this is where the single issue self-identification part comes in for me because what that means ladies and gentlemen is if you identify it that way single issue that policy position is a frame of reference for every other thing so reproductive health access has very little to do directly with let's say economics or national security or trade but if you orient yourself as how you're gonna evaluate whomever is appearing before you in a political context, first through that policy position, and say, well, I'll make judgments on whether or not they're near to me or too far away from me on all these other matters, first by evaluating them there, then it seems to me to have a potentially larger potency. The one concern I have about that is if abortion, if this was enough of a mover to get the election decided, then I don't think we would need Kamala Harris as a nominee in the first place. Like Joe Biden would have done and sort of on policy issues, like behaved exactly the same as Kamala. So the question is, there are those voters out there, but when Biden was lagging Trump in the polls, it was because abortion rights by themselves were not enough to get the job done. So again, while it, I think it benefits Harris enormously that she's a much more compelling advocate, much more compelling messenger on these issues than Biden ever was. I think that the political shortcomings of the Biden campaign illustrate why that message by itself, even though it's a winner, not enough to get the job done. What about democracy and its future? I think the best judgment on that is how little Harris talks about that compared to how much Biden was. And at the very least, 
I am sympathetic to the argument in all the practical ways, but I can't be the only person who feels like the shift from Trump as authoritarian threat to everything that's good in the world to creepy weird old guy and Republicans sort of the Waltzian of the Waltzianification of the message or the weirding of the Republican Party. At the very least, it's something new. If you believe that Donald Trump is an existential threat to democracy, your vote is already banked. And especially for those burn it down moderates who are the line that David Axrod uses, which I like a lot, is that if the fate of democracy is a kitchen table issue for you, then you're eating steak every night, right? You are doing pretty well already. For anyone else who's worried about paying the bills, it can be a factor. But if that was enough to get enough to seal the case about Trump, again, we wouldn't need to have turned to Harris in the first place as Democrats. Should Democrats always assume that America is and for the foreseeable future will be a center right country? I think no, absolutely not. And this is where I don't think a center right country would have elected Barack Obama resoundingly two times in a row. I think more that, resoundingly the first time than the second. Uh, close enough the second, yeah. Squeaker in the second time. But I would take it right now, just get, give it what, the, what happened next. But it's also just the fact that Democrats have won, what is it, nine out of the last 10 popular votes, right? This is not, it's a much more complicated picture. And this is one reason is that because you have these burn it down moderates who don't fall neatly into either camp, the idea that conservative or liberal really explains what's going on, that's going to mischaracterize a country that over the last 60 years has moved enormously on cultural issues in a progressive direction at the same time that it's also become much more unequal economically. And there are a lot of people who appreciate the progress that has been made so far, but are just understandably cautious about what happens next and are really frustrated about the economic side of the story. And if Democrats just assume that the country is center right, that can lead either to a sort of excess of pandering that misjudges where voters actually are or to an assumption that nothing can ever change. And I think both of those are misguided. In the 2016 campaign, which I covered extensively, Donald Trump never assailed Bernie Sanders as a communist. He's already begun that with Kamala Harris. How should she deal with comrade Kamala? She doesn't, she can prove that she's not every day on the stump by the substance of what she's proposing. And even Bernie Sanders will say that what he's doing isn't radical at all because he's a smart enough politician to recognize that claiming the normal ground, even before Tim Wallace came along, Bernie was saying, what I'm doing, yes, it's, it's New Deal democracy, what I'm supporting, and that this works in the American tradition and that this is something that speaks to the interests of ordinary Americans struggling to make ends meet. And there are a lot of them out there. And should Kamala Harris be reminded that Trump never calls Bernie Sanders a communist because many of his supporters have that populist orientation? They just come around it from a different original ideological vantage point? Yeah, Bernie, 30 well, seconds. I remember in 20, 2016, Bernie was trying to get those, a lot. sorry, Trump was trying to get a lot of those Bernie Sanders supporters on board. He recognizes that they're up for grabs and Kamala can win them too. Timothy Shank has been our guest. I told you this would be great. Stay tuned for your takeout, outtake especially where we'll have one more conversation with Timothy. Thank you. See you next week. There was never a more euphoric convention than Republicans just a few weeks ago, and we saw how quickly the ground can shift under their feet. Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. Timothy Shank is our special guest. Forthcoming book out in October, Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics. Uh, and in this New York Times piece that you wrote that I quite admire, Harris has a rare chance to re-engineer her party. You talk about something that I want you all to listen to carefully because you're going to hear, you're going to be beaten over the head from now to November 5th election day with references to swing voters. You write about swing one, and swing two voters. Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. Proceed. So this was the two groups that Bill Clinton's campaign was targeting when he's running for re-election in 1996. And one group, those swing one voters, they've been remembered as the soccer moms. So in contrast to those burn it down moderates that we've been talking about who are more populist on economic issues and a little bit more conservative or moderate on the cultural ones. These, at least as presented at the time, were a little bit more libertarian, a little more conservative on economics, and also more progressive on the cultural issues. And swing two was the opposite. So if swing one is the soccer mom, swing two are those Ross Pro voters. And the key point for Clinton in 96 is that they couldn't afford to be blown out with either camp. And should 
my audience think of Swing 1 as principally suburbanites and Swing 2 as exurbanites, not fully rural, but not enjoying, let us say, all the economic perquisites of suburban life? Exactly, more working class. Although one reason why I'm more optimistic about bringing those Swing 1 voters along with Swing 2 in a Harris coalition is that the suburbs also have become a lot more economically complicated in the last generation. And even Clinton strategists like Mark Penn and Doug Schoen, who were in charge of putting this campaign together in 96, by the 2000s, even before the financial crash, they were pointing out, these those swing vote, one voters, they're doing okay, but they're worrying about paying the bills too. Mm -hmm. So there is an underlying sense of economic insecurity that's deeply present for those swing two, but as years have gone by, swing ones felt a lot less protected as well. What was Hillary Clinton's orientation to swing one and swing twos? All in on swing one and swing two goes into the basket of deplorables, unfortunately. To her detriment and everlasting dismay. It was the sense that the mistake we now see is Clinton trying to run a almost a caricature version of the Obama campaign because Obama was much more attuned to getting everyone on board. His campaign, the strategy at least, looked a lot more Bill Clintonian than Hillary Clintonian. And since Hillary ran the version in 2016 of what the caricature of what Obama ran in 2012 as just the sort of face of a multicultural, diverse, progressive, educated America, when in fact Obama fit much more with that economic populist, culturally sensible strategy that Clinton really perfected in the 90s. What's the most important thing Kamala Harris can do and what is the most damaging mistake she could make? So the most important thing she can do is make herself into a champion of middle class values and interests. Lean into everything that she can as sort of the best of that Democratic Party tradition. The worst mistake she can make is just thinking that attacking Donald Trump will be enough. And also, and I've seen this happen to campaigns, that have a unexpected and sort of joyous boost of momentum, hold on to that too tightly. Yeah, and this is almost sort of a mistake that we just saw Republicans make. And the, there was never a more euphoric convention than Republicans just a few weeks ago. And we saw how quickly the ground can shift under their feet. So to think that just because they're ahead now that they've got this election in the bag, that's exactly how campaigns are lost. Timothy Schenck, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, the book coming out in October, Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics, History and Politics Professor at the George Washington University. That concludes this Takeout Outtake Especial. We'll see you next week, folks. Thanks so much.